Hello, everyone. My name is Princess Tara Zamani, and I am an undergraduate research assistant at the University of Utah. I'm currently a senior at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and I've been in the Europe program for two semesters. Um, my technical advisor is Dr. Neil Cotter, and our research is focused on spiking neural network modeling and applying that model to an XOR application. So I know I'm talking to an audience of varying backgrounds. So just to give you a general idea, we are modeling a neuron and we are able to come up with a transfer function that kind of maps the inputs to the outputs of the neuron. Our team has actually gone one step further and created a graphing tool to be able to graph this transfer function, which is actually something that hasn't been done in industry before. So that's really exciting because we all know that when you're doing anything that involves mathematics, being able to visualize what you're doing is always a beneficial tool to have. You're able to use that transfer function later on when doing our XOR application. So it was very beneficial. So I will do a brief overview of this presentation. I will first begin with our research motivation and really what's driving us to do this research project. Next, I'll go into spiking neural networks and what they are specifically. Then we'll talk about the specific mathematical model that we're using, which is the linear synaptic response model. After that, we'll talk about the XOR application generally, and I'll provide an example that's done in industry. And we'll talk about our results that we got using our simulation model. Finally, I'll conclude with talking about where this research can lead in the future work. So, First, before going into the research motivation, right, we kind of have to ask the question, what are we trying to achieve, right? And our ideal goal is inspired by the human brain, right? This is what we're trying to replicate in using technology. And this is such a complex structure. You may be thinking, well, where do we begin? You know, there's so much to it that we still, some things we still don't even know. So just like in any science, you begin with the basics and the fundamentals. So that is the neuron. So the neuron is the basic cell of the human brain. You can see that we have the input branches, which are the dendrites. There's a cell body called the soma. The axon, which is kind of in transition branch to the outputs, which are the synapses. So neurons, they communicate with each other through electric spikes. I've denoted those with these red kind of waveforms on the screen. Those spikes enter on different branches at varying times, and the soma kind of processes them and determines that if the accumulation of them is greater than a internal voltage threshold, then the neuron fires its own spike. Then that spike travels down the axon until it reaches the synapses. The synapses then individually um, apply their own weights to the spike. This could be, you can think of this as, they're kind of scaling the spike as before it goes on to the next neuron. So now that we've covered the basics of how this works, let's talk about what is present in industry today and more of what's driving us to do our research. And that requires us to talk about artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is very software focused right now in the field. You may have heard the terms machine learning or deep learning and those are really just algorithms that people are trying to constantly improve. Those algorithms use artificial neural networks, which are different than spiking neural networks. Artificial neural networks, here is kind of an image of how they work. So you have your inputs, x1 through xn, those get multiplied by a weight and summed together, and that sum goes through some sort of activation function to determine the output of the neuron. Now you can see that the inputs and output x one through xn and y, these are just values, they're just number values, and they're really representing the average firing rate of the electric spikes coming in or going out of the neuron. So it's just an average number, which really there's lots of information there, right? If you're just taking the average over a whole bunch of spikes, then you're not really getting the impact that each individual spike has on the behavior of the neuron, which is really beneficial information to have when you're going through and wanting to train a network. So those are artificial neural networks and how they are being used. The algorithms altogether are very resource intensive, right? It takes a lot of 
computation power to be able to do all of these computations for over and over and over again for however many neurons. And the hardware that we have right now in our computers and our phones, it, it just wasn't built for to do these types of intensive computations. So right now in industry, AI is very limited to the hardware that it's being run on. So that's kind of a limitation that we have there and something that our research can contribute to. So back to the human brain, right? We have discussed artificial neural networks and we know that that averaging takes away some of the information that's there. So what is a way that we can more accurately model the, each of the individual neurons? Well, that brings us to spiky neural networks. So SNNs are based on those electric spikes that I had mentioned earlier when discussing the neuron. The way that they communicate information is within those spike times, similar to the biological neuron again. So I have an image down here below, and we can now see that the input incoming spikes, the X1 through Xn, are not only do we actually see the spikes now, but these are, we can see that it's clearly on a time domain. So the timing in these networks are, is really crucial because that's what's transferring the information. And the same thing with the output spikes, we can see that it is also on a time domain. So these incoming spikes, each one of them, when at the time that it comes in, it activates a waveform. And in this case, it uses a square waveform as can, see, as can be seen in part A. Those inputs are then weighted by a synaptic wake and we can see the different amplitudes shown right here and also in part B, the different amplitudes and the overlapping of those waveforms, right? Because they come in as spikes and if it's a wave, then they overlap. And since they overlap, then within the spiking neuron, they can accumulate to a waveform, kind of like in part C. And if those accumulations pass the threshold, as we discussed, then the neuron fires. And we can see that it passes the threshold two times in this example, hence the two different output spikes. Now, I urge you to think about how costly it can be for these networks to continuously be doing these calculations, right? It, for all of the different synapses and all of the different neurons, it can get quite costly. So is there a way that we can make it even more efficient? And there absolutely is. That is called an event-driven SNN. And what an event-driven SNN is, is that the neuron only processes information when it needs to, aka when an event occurs. An event in this context can be anything that really changes the system, such as neuron firing or a new incoming impulse spike, anything like that. But if there's nothing to be processed, then the neuron sits idly. So with this type of SNN, it's very power efficient, which is a really important thing to consider when we're trying to model the brain, right? Because if we think about the human brain, it's incredible. There's trillions of neurons doing so many different computations, and yet it only uses 20 watts of power, which is insane. So if we're trying to model something in technology that is that is even close to being that efficient one day, then power efficiency is going to be a huge bottleneck in that. So Using event-driven SNN is a great way to start to address those issues. So now we come to the linear spike response model. This is the model that we chose to go with in our approach. And what this means is that all the synaptic inputs are combined linearly, just, I, just as I had discussed in the previous slide. Um, there are other models out there that model the internals of a spiking neural network a little bit differently, but this is one that we chose to go to. Um, yeah, but one thing that sets ours model aside from the other ones out there is the shape that we use for our synapse inputs. Now on the previous slide, you may remember that they use square waves for each one of their spikes. So the spike activates a square wave. In our model, we use triangular input spikes or input waves, excuse me. So those are coming in for the neurons' inputs. And I'll explain the significance of this in the next slide. For our neurons' outputs, this is also called the action potential, 
we just use a normal spike form, as you have seen previously. Um, the reason for this is that the neuron output, we only really care about the time. The shape of it doesn't really matter too much like it does for the inputs that the input can change its behavior, right? But the output spike, we really just care about the time. And then this time goes to the next neuron. And when the next neuron receives it, another triangular synapse is um, generated at that time. So within the context of one neuron, we have our input shapes and our output shape. The figure on the right is our computer simulation of our model. You can see the different red triangular input spikes coming in at different times, slightly different times. And then we have the accumulation shown in green, with the, which is also called the membrane potential. Um, and it's slowly adjusting whenever each new spike is introduced until it reaches a threshold in which the firing time is then determined. So you can see our inputs are triangles, our output is the spike. So why are we using triangular synapses? Well, I'm gonna take it right back to the biological neuron because that is what we are shooting for after all. So on the far right, you can see the shapes of the different waveforms. The top one is the biological neuron that follows this sort of shape. We can see that there is a nice rise time and there's also a finite decay time which means that it goes from the peak all the way down to zero within a set amount of time. Those are two important characteristics here. The next two I've added just for references. Um, IBM made a neuromorphic chip a while back that used, that used this type of spike shape where it just shoots right up. So there is no rise time in this and there's kind of a step function down. So it would have a finite decay time, but that having no rise time, there's a loss of information there. Another possible model is the alpha, alpha function, which is a little more rounded like the biological neuron. However, it only converges to zero and never hits zero, which will cause some computational issues if not addressed. And lastly is our triangular model, which maintains both of those important characteristics, right? We have the rise time, and then we also have the finite decay time. So there's, both of those characteristics are present, and although it's not as much rounded, um, having both of those is really a bit more important. So that's why we chose to do the triangular synapse. And with that, it, since, triangulars, since triangles are linear, it also fits right into our LSRM model. So now the XOR application. For those of you that may not be in the field, an XOR gate is a really common Kind of basic logic element that is used to make up different technologies. This is the simple symbol we use for them and this is the truth table. So what this is saying is that when you have an input of zero zero then your output is going to be zero. If you have an input combination of zero one then your output is going to be one and so on. So people use neural networks in industry and they apply it to this XOR application. So they often train their neural network to have this sort of functionality. One example is from Sander Boti, which did just that with a SNN model of his own. Within just little details about his model, he used pretty standard impulse spike shapes similar to that of IBM's shown on the previous slide. Um, with his model, he really focused on creating a smooth surface within his graph. So he used interpolation to do that. And then he also used about 10 neurons to get this configuration. So to go a little bit more into depth into the graph and make it make a little bit more sense. Oh, my bad. Let me move my face. So since spiky neural networks are due are based on timing, right? There needs to be a transition between the timing to logical zeros or ones. So for his model, he used a time of zero to signify a logical zero and a time of 13 to signify a logical one. So in his graph, we can see that at the input zero, zero, and at the input one, one, that the time is, that the time is 10. Whereas at the input, zero one and 
1, 0, the output is 13, which would be a logical 1, just like in the truth table. So he did achieve this functionality by training his neural network. Now on to our results. So with R, as you can see, our graph is a little bit different, and there's a reason for that. Um, so we used three neurons to achieve this functionality, and we only focused on the corner cases. So that's why our graph is a little bit different. We didn't so much focus on the in-betweens, but just what the truth table outputs are. So for ours, our timing diagram is a little bit different. Our Logical one is at a time of 1.75, and our logical zero is 1.9. You can see in the graph now that at a time of 1, 1, we have an output of about 1.9, and the same thing for 0, 0, 1.9, whereas 0, 1 and 1, 0, our output is about 1.75. So we also achieved the same functionality, which really just further validates our model for its correctness. And I also think it's important to note that we actually didn't need to train our model to be able to get this output. Since we had the transfer function and were able to use our graphical tool, we could kind of skip the training step and give it the information that it needed to be able to get these, um, to get this output, which is just another benefit of having that tool available for us. Future work. Right, where does this go next? So we mentioned in the beginning that our AI growth right now is very limited to the hardware restrictions, right? So naturally, the next thing would, to do would be to use this model and create the hardware, which just happens to be my senior thesis. So I am taking the model that we're using and we've tested, and I'm using an FPGA or a field programmable gate array to design the hardware for it. This is more or less just fancy hardware where you can um, make it do whatever you want it to do. So that is my senior thesis and I'm working on that right now and it's been a fun journey so far and hopefully I'll be finishing that up at the end of this year. And with that, I'd like to conclude this presentation and I have listed my contact information here and references for these slides. And if you have any questions about what we talked about or any interest in learning more about it, please feel free to reach out to me through LinkedIn or my email. And thank you so much for listening. I hope you all have a good day.